Welcome. I am Aikari, a multimedia reporter for Rappler. This is the fourth episode of the Budget Watch webinar hosted by Rappler and iLeague in partnership with Move as One Coalition. Today, we're going to talk about the priorities in the proposed 2021 budget, particularly on mobility. To give us an overview of the transportation and mobility budget, joining us today is Louise Razon Abad, iLeague's chairman of the board. Luis has served as a student leader, policy analyst in the Philippine Senate, chief of staff to the Secretary of Finance, election campaigner, teacher, business development manager, and social entrepreneur. He is currently a part-time lecturer at the Economics Department of the Ateneo School of Government. Uh, Luis, you have the screen now. All right, thanks. Thanks, Aika. Let me just share the screen. Yeah, thanks, Aika. Just a quick intro on um, iLead. So iLead is a uh, non-stop, non-profit think tank that really focuses right now on fiscal policy research and really trying to help citizens engage public finance, especially the national budget, since essentially uh, this is our money and they're funded from our taxes. So today, uh, we'd just like to talk about the infrastructure and mobility budget in the proposed um, uh, national expenditure program for next year. The proposed budget for next year as submitted by the executive to Congress is at 4.5 trillion uh, pesos. So this is uh, an increase from uh, the current planned spending for this year, which was originally set at 4.1 trillion, but because of the uh, pandemic and the additional um, expenditures that have been approved through Bayanihan 1 and 2, the forecast like expected spending for this year is 4.3 trillion. So next year's spending is 200 billion more than um, this year. So, so one of the biggest um, interventions the government is designing uh, in response to COVID and in response to the economic slowdown uh, as a result of COVID for next year is infrastructure. So they have set 1.1 trillion pesos, which is 24% of the 4.5 trillion budget um, for infrastructure with an end in mind of utilizing infrastructure in rebounding the economy, in, in making sure that uh, we uh, go back to the growth levels that we were before. And uh, the two biggest uh, recipients or the two biggest implementers of this build, build, build project is DPWH and um, DOTR, you know, Department of Transportation, uh, with DPWH receiving $667 billion and DOTR receiving $129 billion. What we'd like to highlight is that this thinking that infrastructure has a big multiplier, that infrastructure uh, can serve as the major multiplier for, for growth, is, uh, you know, it, it's true that that is backed by um, uh, theoretical evidence and, and by, by theory and some historical evidence in other countries. But what's interesting is if you look at the current uh, experience of the Philippine economy with regard to infrastructure and government spending, it doesn't seem to be there. So, so the logic for the multiplier is that essentially when government spends, there is additional um, you know, uh, interest that is created from private investors to also invest and grow their businesses. But what's interesting if you look at this graph, especially the tail end, is that while in recent years government spending has increased, investment growth has stalled. So the question that uh, one is led to is why hasn't government increased government spending resulted into more interest from private investors to actually spend more and invest in increasing the productive capacity of the economy? And, and if this is the trend that we're looking at before COVID, uh, it leads one to question this um, uh, big bet on infrastructure as the main driver of recovery from COVID. It's like we're putting all our eggs in one basket and that basket is build, 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 which if you look at the record for the past four years, hasn't seemed to generate that much investment 
uh, as we'd hope to. The same data can be uh, uh, cut in a different manner uh, with this slide. This sli the previous slide showed the absolute levels at constant prices. This slide shows the growth rates of the components at constant prices. And if, and if you look at historically, uh, the logic of government spending trying to elevate private investments was uh, you know, present um, in the early years of 2010, the early years of this decade. But in the past three years, you can see that the growth in government expenditures has not kicked in or has not accelerated the growth in private investment. Uh, in fact, from in, in 2018 and 2019, the growth of expenditures was way more than the growth of private investment. And so the question is, where is the multiplier? If we're going to bet big time on build, build, build as our recovery platform, what evidence are we looking at that shows us that the projects that we have allocated the build, build, build um, budgets to are actually growth enhancing and not really just purely uh, government expenditures. And, and that's one thing that um, hopefully uh, can be looked uh, closer. So let's look at the budget of DPWH, which is the main actor taking in 667 billion of, of the 1 trillion budget. So DPWH budgets have constantly been increasing. Um, the blue bar shows the new appropriations. The orange bar is the actual disbursements. This means this is the actual cash that is paid to um, contractors of DPWH, employees of DPWH. And as you can see, there is a, um, a gap no? um, showing that the amounts we've allocated to DPWH they have not been able to successfully execute in the time that they have been um, given, meaning a lot of the technical term used by analysts here is absorptive capacity, the ability of the agency to absorb the budget that is allocated to it. So we can see that um, there is a lot of money left on the table, and, and the question then is, in this time of um, limited fiscal space because of the uh, slowdown in the economy, do we have the luxury to leave money on the table or are the funds allocated to DPWH? Is a part of it better off allocated elsewhere because historically they have not been able to spend the budgets allocated to them. And we can see that um, now in 2020, uh, given the uh, logistical problems with the lockdowns, there could be a e deterioration even of their um, absorptive capacity. But we're just talking here of amounts. We're not even talking about the composition or the, or the quality of, of these projects. So if you look at um, the breakdown of these budgets, across the board, there's been an increase. Um, asset preservation, network development, bridge, flood management, local programs. So across the board, all the different um, component projects that the DPWH implemented, implements um, is, is going to go up. This is quite an interesting slide. This, this uh, chart shows you the breakdown of the budget based on the major DPWH programs. So the light blue is asset preservation. Asset preservation is essentially uh, maintenance work on existing roads, um, existing, uh, essentially existing roads. Network development, the dark blue, is the money allocated for new roads, um, new bypasses, um, essentially enhancing the road network. So expanding it, making sure that there is, um, uh, you know, the, the numbers of, the number of kilometers that uh, is, uh, concretized or um, passable is funded through that budget component. The yellow one is the bridge program. So this is new and maintenance of bridges. The green one is um, flood management. So these are mostly uh, sewer systems or uh, dike. The pink one is local program. So local program 
the composition of local program changes in different ways. Local program means it, these are infrastructure projects that DPWH constructs, but it's essentially, uh, eventually turned over to LGUs. So sometimes, usually this is a mix of local roads, so minor roads, as well as um, buildings, uh, multi-purpose buildings. So here you they, you will see a variety of barangay halls, of covered courts, of civic centers. Uh, the permutation is expanding uh, depending on uh, uh, what uh, the proponents can think of. And um, the light blue or, or, or the teal bar is the convergence and special support. So um, in, in planning, DPWH has introduced this program so that they can work together with tourism department in identifying roads to tourist destinations. Uh, that has expanded to convergence programs with DTI on improving roads to um, industrial zones. Um, and recently in the news, uh, this program has also been expanded to include um, infrastructure with uh, uh, national security value. So this was uh, recently in the news because um, a lot of uh, some senators were questioning what uh, compo what were what composed that um, that line item and why is suddenly DPWH the one uh, doing that. So if you look at across the years, um, what's very noticeable is the increase of the share of local program, the pink bar. So. In, in, in government pronouncements, they always talk about build, build, build as this program, centerpiece program that funds key strategic infrastructure that will enhance the, the economy's productive capacity. But if bulk of that program is the, it, it, you know, consists of local multipurpose buildings and local uh, minor roads, it leads you to question if the people making the headlines are aligned with the people that are actually making the budget. Because if our infrastructure program is led by local programs, then the red flag is, what is the strategy behind uh, all of these? So the question we post on the side is, with local infra exceeding network development, is build, 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 in reality, just port, port, port. And so rather than this grand um, golden age of infrastructure, what we have is really the disintegration of an infra strategy into really whatever I can build um, in my district. And, and I think that is very different from how build, build, build uh, was first presented and continues to be presented. Another interesting trend that we're seeing that probably explains why infra spending is not accelerating private investment spending and why infra spending disbursements have not kept up with the budgets that they've been provided is the increasing centralization of infra budgets with the DPWH central office. You can see from in 2016, uh, the bias was to regional offices so that the regional offices can quickly implement the projects. Now in next year's budget, 90% is lodged in the central office. So there are two problems that uh, you know, this will create. One is the excessive discretion by a central authority, meaning 90% of the infrastructure budget is going to be bid out by the central office bids and awards committee. That's, uh, it's like saying there's one back that rules them all. And, and this back controls 600 billion of government expenditures. So that will, of course, have cost implementation delays. At the same time, that will uh, result into a lot of you know, uh, temptation for uh, leakages, um, for uh, some contractors maybe having better access to the one back rather than spreading these um, infrastructure budgets across the different regional offices. So I guess looking at it this way makes all this fight in the budget uh, you know, more understandable that 
because of this discretion, it's really important who is able to dictate what is done by the central office. And uh, that gives uh, reasoning as to why even in the middle of the pandemic, there was this whole uh, uh, power struggle in the House of Representatives. So in this slide, we showed you that around 10% is uh, given and disaggregated in the budget. So among this 10%, we broke it down. So realize that, uh, understand that um, this breakdown is just 10% of the total pie. But looking at this 10% that has been broken down, um, you see these uh, provinces and district engineering offices uh, that enjoy higher shares. And um, questions come to mind. Um, what, what is the strategy behind um, the identification of these engineering offices of these districts as our main infrastructure drivers? Is there a economic strategy behind it? Or is this really purely political patronage uh, front and center? And I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you match the district engineering offices with the representatives that voted for key legislation, i.e. the ABS-CBN franchise removal, sterile bill, that you will see a lot of um, uh, uh, alignment. Davao City, Cavite, Camarines Sur, so on and so forth. But this is just 10%. So the 90% of the budget is still with the central office and is still and is yet to be disaggregated. So I think we can expect um, uh, DPWH and the House of Representatives to finalize that breakdown uh, once the version of the House is uh, prepared. Interestingly, also, we looked at the revised build, build, build project list that was uh, relaunched in August. And uh, there was only uh, 17 of the 42 projects identified with DPWH that is funded in the net. So if the flagship projects were of priority, and if, there, if these are really shovel ready, how come less than half is funded in next year's budget? Uh, again, uh, what, what, why the mismatch? Are those speaking for build, 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 not talking to the ones preparing the budget? And it would seem like that's the case. And if build, build, build is supposed to be the main driver of economic growth, how come only 10% of DPWH budget will go to the flagship build, build, build projects? What is the 90% for? Why are they not uh, part and parcel of this strategic intervention of government? So the second infrastructure um, uh, player or implementer is, is DOTR. So DOTR has also uh, seen its budget uh, increase. And the same with DPWH, the DOTR absorptive capacity as uh, something that um, it has uh, consistently struggled with. In fact, you can see uh, while their budgets have increased, their disbursements have actually, if you think about it, been quite stagnant in the past um, five years. So breaking it down, um, we can see, a, a, you, you can say it's a, it's a drastic shift because DOTR was supposed to fund uh, across the board. Uh, rail, uh, non-rail, aviation, maritime. But because of the price tags of the major rail project, they have taken over the entire DOTR budget. So uh, aviation has gone down, maritime has gone down, uh, motor vehicle and land public transportation has gone down. And the major increases are in the subway, the North-South commuter railway system um, and the other rail projects. So, so visually, you can also see it um, through this chart that the light blue line of the rail transport has really accelerated and has really taken over the fiscal space of, of the others. And uh, related to our conversation, 
um, while Bayanihan 2 provided for service contracting provisions so that given the uh, you know difficulty of meeting the financials for public utility vehicles given the um, distancing rules there really needs to be a subsidy mechanism or, or a way for government to be able to make sure that um, public transport is available to commuters but none of that is provided for in next year's budget and and one thing i would also like to highlight is that um, I, what's happening with the DOTR budget, I think, is reflective of the early decisions to shift away from solicited PPP. Uh, and so what we're seeing is that instead of having a PPP project that would have um, you know, developed the uh, operations and maintenance of several key regional airports that was ready for bid in uh, late 2016, we could have those projects being implemented now without any budget support because it will be privately funded. Nothing is going to happen with those regional airports now and next year because government funding has been taken up by the subway and the commuter south railway extension. I'm not saying those two projects are not important. It's just that this policy decision early on, we are seeing the practical impact. There is no more money left for nitrating of airports, very little money left for improving of ports. It has been concentrated in rail. And, and this is the practical implication of uh, insisting that everything be funded by the GAA. And so if before, given the limited space, there was ability to grow uh, the Mactan Cebu International Airport while at the same time maintain the nitrating now everything is going to be funded by government and so we have less projects in the pipeline so looking at it two years three years down the road what will be you know what's going to be uh, ready for ribbon cutting uh, there might not be any again we did an exercise of com comparing with a build 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 project list only five of 40 dotr flagship projects are in the build 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 list and essentially, these five projects take up 70% of the entire DOTR budget. Metro Manila Subway, North-South Commuter Railway, um, MRT Rehab, PNR South Long Haul, and the new Cebu International Container Airport. So again, this is the implication of insisting that everything be funded uh, through the national government. An interesting um, aspect of this build, build, build um, move is the increasing role of BCDA uh, in the infrastructure build 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 up um, from zero receiving zero subsidies from national government in 2014 and 2015 it reached a peak of 15 billion uh, in 2019 and will continue to receive subsidy next year at 5 billion this is very interesting for an agency that was originally designed to remit profits to the national government rather than receive subsidies the mandate of BCDA is to develop military assets so that they can be uh, used to enhance and modernize the armed forces. But rather than remitting, they are now receiving uh, subsidies from national government. And um, the question there is why the sudden shift? Why, is, why are we investing so much in, in new Clark? Why is the national government investing so much in new Clark City? When BCDA has the balance sheet, BCDA has the assets, uh, BCDA has the resources, undertake this um, uh, on its own. And lastly, on this piece of um, infrastructure, is uh, the infrastructure that you know, we've woken up to as very essential in almost everything, especially right now in the middle of COVID. It's, it's the digital infrastructure. And uh, I flashed here a uh, survey that F SWS has uh, put up, uh, and internet use is only at half uh, of the population. So the question is, understandably, uh, a lot of our digital infra is uh, left to the private players that um, are tasked to do this. But in many jurisdictions in the Philippines, where it does not make financial sense for these um, uh, companies it, wh where it will not be profitable for these companies to build up. What is the policy of government 
for them. And ideally, this was something that we all woke up to with this COVID uh, crisis and, and the critical role that digital infra plays from, infra from education to health, to work, even now to, to mobility. Uh, sadly, uh, nothing much about that is in next year's budget. All we have, the biggest recipient of the budget is a free Wi-Fi program, but understand that Wi-Fi is still dependent on the main uh, broadband uh, access or satellite access and the national government data center. So basically uh, uh, digitizing government data, nothing much about how we as a, you know, especially in provinces that uh, are not that dense that will make Prof, that will you know generate profits for the private companies in this area. What is the government support for that? So just to end, um, human capital has been the call of a lot of different stakeholders, requesting for additional alignment for social welfare, for education, and we've seen the budget for these be sorely lacking. While at the same time, there's still a lot of budget for we've seen most of the increases are in physical infra, the ones we've discussed earlier, as well as in um, security forces. So as we discuss about the tweaks we need, um, this trade-off that we're seeing in the budget might be something that we will have, that will have to be revisited, uh, hopefully by the senators as well as by the bicameral conference committee. So just to end um, with that, as the zoom in of, of, of the budget for infrastructure mobility, other concerns keeping in mind, you know, that um, the budget will have to fund not just transport, not just infrastructure mobility, but all other considerations. We listed down some other realities that we need to be mindful of as we work towards advocating for realignment, so it's the continuing uh, economic recession, increasing um, the deficit, the deterioration in jobs both here and for our OFWs abroad, uh, as well as the continuing challenges to the delivery of these services and the impending reallocation of up to 260 billion with the Mandana's ruling implementation due for 2022. So a lot of these policy considerations seem to have been left out in the discussions of the budget. And if we're going to advocate for realignment, these are realities that we should be mindful of. So with that, thank you, uh, Aika. Okay. Uh, thank you, Luis. That was very insightful. We talked about infrastructure, transportation, and the increasing role of BCDA in all of these, you know. So um, I'll ask our panelists, I'll introduce them first to, um, to react on Luis's uh, presentation. So joining us today are Sir Robert C., Sir Joshua Mata, and architect Paolo Alcazarin. So um, Robert C. is a sustainable mobility advocate and a columnist for the Manila Times. He served as an advisor for the Department of Transportation during the Aquino administration and other stints in the Asian Development Bank, World Bank, and the, and the Asian Institute of Management. Robbie C. is part of the Move As One Coalition a group advocating for a safer, more inclusive, and more humane public transportation system in the Philippines. Hello, Sir Robbie. Hi, Aika. So, Good um, afternoon. Joshua. <laughs> Hello, Sir. Um, we have also Sir Joshua Mata. He is a labor organizer and a co-convener of the Nagkaisa, one of the broadest um, labor coalitions in the country. He also serves as the current Secretary General of Centro ng Mga Nagkakaisa, at progresibong manggagawa. And he's also an active member and sectoral representative of the Move As One Coalition. Hello, sir. Hi, Aika. Hello, everyone. Hello, okay. And then lastly, we have architect Paolo Alcazarin. He is an urban planner and principal of the PGAA Creative Design, a multidisciplinary consultancy firm engaged in planning, urban design, and landscape architecture. His best known project is the Iloilo Esplanade, and he has prepared master plans for several LGUs nationwide, as well as for large private developments with an emphasis on mobility and open space. Hello, architect. Hi, Aika. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, so let's start po, no, um, 
um, reactions or assessment um, given the presentation of Luis? Let's start with Sir Robbie and then Sir Joshua and then Architect uh, Paolo. Yeah, th thanks, Aika, and thanks to Luis and the iLeads team for a very good analysis. So let me just jump in. Um, even before the pandemic, we all know that mobility was severely constrained and public transport was uh, already obviously insufficient, inadequate. Lots of people were struggling to get to work, to school every day. And the pandemic has actually made things uh, even worse, partly, you know, partly because of the requirement for physical distancing. So that, that reduced the capacity of most public transport. So in looking at the budgets today, what we need from both DOTR and DPWH are budgets that will be pandemic responsive and will deliver early results. We need to expand safe mobility options for as many people as possible. So this means, you know, in every city, in every municipality, we need to expand options for public transport, making, uh, making them uh, first available and more efficient. So uh, we have been campaigning on the side for activating all public transport modes, uh, including open air jeepneys, which we know, you know, the um, authorization has still been uh, curtailed by LTFRB. We need for all of that to come out. Second, we need to make these different public transport modes financially viable so that uh, they will be willing to operate and will operate on a safe and sustainable basis. And this is why uh, we have been campaigning, one for service contracting as a mode for uh, enabling public transport operators and drivers to have sustainable and stable livelihoods. So it means basically that government needs to make sure that transport services are paid, you know, what they need to, uh, you know, an income that they need to have in order to maintain their operations. Second is, even with all public transport activated, there will still be a deficit. We know that because of the, uh, the severity in terms of the physical distancing. So we need to have actually safe walking and cycling as good travel options. So this means in every city and municipality, we should now create safe walking and cycling networks. So this is a big part of our, our uh, advocacy. The last part is to make all public transport move more efficiently. So this means that we have to give priority in the use of road space to buses, jeepneys, UV express, and other types of public transport using perhaps uh, PUV only lanes and more efficient terminals, bus stops, and uh, other, other types of infrastructure. Cashless fare collection systems are also important. Now in all of this, these measures are largely absent from both budgets of DPWH and DOTR, even though we know uh, these measures are perhaps uh, most urgently needed at the time of the pandemic and can deliver early results. So, uh, from our point of view, this is one, in a way, glaring, uh, you know, anomaly in the budgets that we have today, and we hope this can be corrected. Another key point that uh, that Luis highlighted is the fact that a lot of the budgets are very much centralized, and because of that, it generates inefficiencies, delays, 
And of course, the, the high possibility that what is actually spent will not be relevant to local needs. So in a way, this is what characterizes uh, our framework, our institutional framework for mobility and transportation and uh, public works. A lot of it is very centralized at the national government agency level. What we need today is to empower more of our local government units to get them more involved in determining what actually gets built, what actually gets spent. And this is how it actually works in most cities in other countries. And this is what is needed today. Uh, we can't have government, well, agencies like DOTR and LTFRB uh, dealing with public transport issues in every municipality, in every city. It's physically uh, impossible. And it certainly creates many, many inefficiencies. And we see a lot of that today. So how can we make that change? We need to begin with the 2021 budget and hopefully some of these ideas will be embedded there, hopefully in the next few weeks and months. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Robbie. Sir Joshua. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Luis, no, for that uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, tingin ko hinighlight ni Luis ang isa sa napakalaking question talaga na crucial sa discussion natin. Eh. Ano ba talaga strategy behind dito sa budget nato? I thought that, that was the most uh, the most important question pa raised by by the presentation. No, uh, but uh, let me add to what uh, Robbie has said as well. No. Um, First of all, let me start by saying that mula pa naman simula nitong pandemic natin, ang malabo talaga para sa amin ano ang strategya rin ng gobyerno, no? Talaga kung paano i-address ito. Mukhang kung meron siyang strategy, eh apparently sa kanyang action, pwede kong i-summarize na ipasa sa mga manggagawa yung pagresolba ng problema. You know, like, you know, it has been let it has been um, letting workers uh, fend for themselves eh, the whole time no walang adequate na PPEs uh, inadequate din yung ating mga testing para do sa kahit na do sa mga nangangailangan no katulad ng mga health workers natin walang paid quarantine leaves at marami pang reklamo no pero syempre pinakamalaking problema ay now that they wanted to they want to open up the economy even further wala namang public transportation kaya maganda yung sinabi ni uh, Sir Robbie, no, na simula pa lang before, even before pandemic, kulang na ang transportasyon. Lalo na ngayon na kinakailangan nating mag-exercise ng physical distancing na sinusubukan nga nila i-reduce eh, no? Uh, at habang at the same time ay kinocurtail naman ang pag-deploy ng iba pa mga public utility vehicles natin, no? Um, and on that point, on that last point ni, na, na yun, uh, mukhang may malaki ang suspicion particularly ng mga uh, open air jeepneys natin na mukhang ginagamit ng gobyerno deliberately itong pandemic na ito para talaga i-realize yung matagal na lang gusto no? yung i-face out yung mga jeepneys natin uh, na sa totoo lang um, nagda-demand ng gobyerno na i-face out ng jeepneys natin na wala naman silang alternatives na pinoprovide sa mga transport workers natin so ano yung gusto naming makita dito sa budget na to, given these conditions. No? Uh, apart from what uh, Robbie said about you know, the need for service contracting in 2021 20, budget, no? tama, tama si Luis, eh, no? wala na talaga yan. Yan yung una namin sinilip actually. No? Wala na nga yun. It, it, para bang ina-assume na wala na tayong uh, corona, wala na tayong pandemic next year, uh, which is not really going to be the case. No? Uh, pangalawa, pinakita out na ni Sir Robbie rin ito, yung kailangan talaga yung i-deploy na yung mas marami pa mga jeepneys natin. No? Right now, out of more than 50,000 jeepneys sa NCR alone, 27,000 pa lang ang pinapayagan nilang ma-deploy. Uh, mas malala ho sa, ano, mas malala sa Cebu at saka sa Mandawe, despite yung request ng local governments doon. Hindi pa rin dini-deploy ang mga open-air jeepneys doon talaga. No? Uh, but ang... Um, isang glaring na malak na wala din sa budget na hindi na natingin ko dapat pag-usapan ay 
paano yung pinangakong pondo na subsidy na ipoprovide ng gobyerno para sa transport modernization? Remember, yung mga transport workers po natin, kung gusto natin sila mag-shift sa, isang, sa cleaner engines no, at and, um, more safer and more efficient uh, vehicles, they would, they would require financial support. Ang demand po ng Move Us One Coalition is actually to raise the current subsidy up to a level ng half a million nga eh, para mas mapabilis talaga ang pag-transition ng mga jeepney drivers natin. So balik mukhang wala rin yan sa, sa budget sa 2021 and that would mean na lalo na namang mababagal at mahihirapan ang mga transport workers natin na mag-shift. Lalo na yung mga kasama natin na gusto namang napayag naman sa transport modernization provided na merong just transition para sa kanila. So, uh, yan po yung mga tingin kong dapat pa nating tignan no, sa, sa budget natin. I'll stop then muna. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir Paolo? Yes, Aika. Uh, uh, thank you first, of course, uh, to Luis for the presentation. And actually, while he was uh, giving his presentation, I, I had a, a lot of uh, pangs of guilt because uh, I had pork, pork chops for lunch. So uh, that unsettled me a bit, especially at sumakit ang ulo ko, especially after hearing the 19% uh, uh, 90% of the funds is controlled uh, in one central agency. So 90% seems to be the figure of the afternoon. 90% of 90% and uh, regional and local just get 10%, which is very uh, frightening. But um, first, first of all, let me let me clarify that I'm not a building architect. So the honorific of architect is a generic one. My friends who are building architects sometimes tell me you shouldn't call yourself an architect because you're an urban planner. So I deal in the larger context. I don't design buildings uh, and we have a lot of good uh, architects who design world-class buildings. The only problem is that uh, it's world-class now, but once you step out, you get run over or you have to fend for your life because we lack uh, the connections between the buildings between the districts and that's where mo mobility comes in. Like uh, Robbie C, uh, a lot of uh, my interest and advocacy is in mobility, of course, uh, because I build things on the ground as a planner and urban designer, and also as a landscape architect for open spaces that we need, especially in this pandemic. People forget that the start and end of uh, all commutes for all of us is by walking. Yet there is nothing in the budgets that uh, uh, seem specific for that part of uh, the commute. And we find in a lot of the places that this first and last mile of our daily, our daily uh, travel is not provided for, along with no provisions for non-motorized transport or alternative methods of uh, getting people from one place to the other. So we don't have that. And I, I assume it's embedded somewhere in, in road infrastructure. But the problem is our public works department have uh, very limited experience in building for people on foot or on bikes. And so we have to uh, reconfigure or reframe uh, the attitude and the, uh, the uh, process of getting this infrastructure done. But it is necessary because that is what we lack. When we were doing the pedestrian improvements for uh, Makati CBD and Ortigas CBD, we found out that uh, the people going to work, our workers and our, our rank and file, would take between 20 and 30 minutes once they get down M MRT, and sometimes just getting down MRT on EDSA, there is no place to walk. It takes them uh, half, uh, 30 minutes to more than that just to get to their offices. And uh, because there are no direct pedestrian routes, which is essentially just a five minute walk. So we, ha we had a project with the DOTR, uh, co-funded by the ADB. The only problem was that the, the monies required for, for that connection was uh, in the range of uh, 250 to 300 million only. So we found that uh, because a lot of our projects that we're involved with, uh, even with the DOTR, which is based on pedestrian, is so cheap that it gets to the bottom of the pile. Hindi pinapansin dahil, mukhang hindi pinapansin, I don't really know. 
and the target of most government action is the, the projects that cost trillions. The infrastructure for people, uh, for walking and for non-motorized is 120th, 130th the cost per linear kilometer uh, to construct. And like Robbie said, it's the fastest that we can do and we need to do it now because we need it in uh, the current pandemic and we need it in the, in the uh, post pandemic or in the new normal. And we have to bring it into the budget and make it a conscious effort of knowing that we're spending this much money because it will improve uh, access, accessibility and mobility. And one final thing, just very quickly to wrap up my, my uh, first, first uh, uh, reflection is the fact that uh, we have to redefine what infrastructure is because nowhere in this uh, analysis is the infrastructure that we, ter we have a terrible lack of, aside from transport, it's housing and hospitals, as, as well as uh, uh, related to that markets and food, food uh, distribution. Um, and these are the things that in a, in a traumatic event like a pandemic or a war, you have to look at. The housing, especially in the pandemic, we are lacking still until now five to six million housing units nationwide. And we have not addressed it the way we are addressing every other infrastructure. And I tell people, we need to build five times as much as Singapore built in the last 25 years, just to catch up with the backlog of housing. We have, we have been in denial as to the uh, drastic uh, problems of housing and hospitals now. Uh, we have, we've seen the effect of the lack of, uh, of tertiary uh, hospital uh, facilities uh, for this pandemic. We've had to build emergency, emergency triage uh, and, and uh, uh, tent, tent hospitals, when in fact we should have a system uh, and a hierarchy of hospitals which are e e e equally equi equitably distant or equitably accessible for all peoples in all of our towns and cities and regions. Those are the things that uh, I find lacking. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, ang napansin po natin talaga dun sa presentation ni Luis din, no? masyadong railway-centric itong um, DOTR budget. So, um, and he was right, and he was right in saying that Dahil nakafocus ito sa railway, yung other projects hindi na nabigyan ng pansin. Siguro yung question ko um, for the three of you, what is the most, um, uh, what needs to be prioritized in terms of, um, kasi question nga natin yung strategy, no? pero ano yung project that we really, really need to prioritize uh, for next year. Maybe we can start po ulit with Sir Robbie and then Sir Paolo and then Sir Joshua. Yeah, thank you, Aika. So tama yung observation ninyo na the budgets are very much, especially DOT, are very much rail-centric. In fact, halos 98% uh, ata ng infrastructure or capital expenditure for public transport is rail. And yung problema nun is the results will only come maybe three, five, six years from now. And what we need today are early results. I think that's number one. Second, kailangan ng balance. Uh, when you look at public transport today, yung rail sector, especially sa Metro Manila, only accounts for maybe, uh, you know, 15% or 10% of the total public transport uh, capacity that's being provided. What we need to focus on is yung making uh, road-based public transport more reliable, more efficient, and that's where there could be a lot of quick wins. So uh, maraming opportunities actually for doing things like bus rapid transit in order to give uh, buses, jeepneys, and other public transport priority in road space. So ito yung uh, uh, quickest way of expanding capacity. By, by putting uh, vehicles on a dedicated lane, they will be able to have a faster travel time, more round trips. They can carry more passengers. They will also be more viable. So I think magandang strategy to 
in order for the OTR to undertake. And already, yung nakikita natin, uh, just yung example of EDSA busway, if you actually put a dedicated lane there, buses move must much faster. It's just a question now of uh, applying that same principle in other contexts. So I think that's one, one, fundamental, uh, one fundamental point. Yeah, so maybe I'll, I'll, uh, I'll stop there to say uh, simply shifting more spending into road-based public transport will generate uh, a lot of early results and benefits for today's commuters. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Sir Paolo? Yes, uh, I agree with Robbie. BRT is uh, much less expensive and uh, faster to implement uh, than rail. We, we still do have to build the terminals for BRT. Kailangan din ang uh, additional infrastructure. At ang uh, kailangan din uh, itayo yung, yung uh, what they call, what we call uh, the intermodal transfer, transfer. So we really need to build additional infra, but it's much less cost than doing the rail. Uh, we will eventually need the rail because we forgot about it the last 50 years and we're just playing catch up again. Eventually rail is, is uh, necessary as in all large uh, cities, uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, Tokyo. Uh, but uh, because we are playing catch up, uh, we ha are spending too much money. I agree with Robbie. We have to make a, a balance uh, decision, a balanced decision for spending, especially for the next year. So BRT is the way to go. Okay, thank you, sir. Sir, um, before I go on to Sir Joshua, lang no, um, yung question about BRT this has been raised um, during the budget hearings. Na parang kini question ng lawmakers. Um, what's happening with the BRT project, no? Because um, matagal na siyang nasa pipeline, supposedly, but um, nagkaroon ng atras abante sa DOTR. So, um, Sir Joshua? Well, let me first uh, respond to the, the previous question. No? I, I completely agree with the points raised no? about having a balance. And that's also the reason why I'm raising the question din ng strategy. Kasi kung ang habol natin talaga ay mabilis ang uh, mabilis ang pagbiyahe ng mga tao. Maraming modes of uh, trans, uh, transportation talaga na kailangan nating suportahan. Including yung active uh, transportation. You know, just just provide making sure na merong maayos na mga bike lanes tayo would most likely move more people than and 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 than than than, than the trains, no? <laughs> if you like at this point in time, no? Uh, so kasi nga mahaba-haba yung investment pa nga abutin niyan. But I agree with Paolo. I mean, eventually, we would have to build those things. Pero ngayon, kailangan natin yung may mabilis na resulta. Again, gusto ko rin din i-emphasize na, na mahirap na ilagay mo lahat ng, ng, ng iyong uh, pondo sa, sa isang strategia, sa isang sa trains lang. When in fact, there are almost half a million transport workers out there whose livelihoods are endangered simply by this transport modernization that they're trying to push and yet they're not providing support for them. So if we, I'm sure we all want to have a more, uh, a better and more efficient uh, PUJs. No, I'm pretty sure of that, no? Uh, pero hindi mangyayari po yun kung nahayaan lang natin, yung mga transport workers nila natin na on their own to do it. They would need a lot of, amount, a lot of support, no? Not just in terms of subsidies to, to, to get you know, their transportation, new, new vehicles, but also in terms of setting up yung kanila mga terminals no uh, in order they can so that they can uh, manage their fleet much more efficiently no and effectively so yung thing, so kaya nga kailangan kailangan bumalik talaga sa tanong eh what is exactly the strategy of the OTR thank you so much po um I'll, I'll move on to another topic no um sir paulo also mentioned this earlier about dun sa planning and um, I mean the DPWH um, being used to doing what they're doing, the contractors being used to doing what they're doing. So um, previously, si um, Secretary Villar is saying that um, the DPWH is going to invest its resources um, pag nagbibuild sila ng bagong roads into incorporating yung plans nila about um, in, in, including bike lanes or um, wider um, infrastructure 
um, pedestrian infrastructure. Siguro, I guess, um, I'll ask for comments na lang po on that. Um, do you think that is feasible for the coming year? Maybe Sir Paolo and Sir Robbie? Robbie? Oh yeah, you know, that's a very good question, Aika. Uh, you know, what, what we have encountered in the past is there is a uh, maybe an openness to doing uh, bicycle lanes and better pedestrian infrastructure. Pero what we also encounter is uh, in the mindset of a lot of, uh, of uh, the DPWH uh, staff, cars remain the priority. You know, it's a, still a very car-centric uh, organization. And this is perhaps one of the things that needs to change so that we can achieve better results. We need roads and bridges, but roads and bridges that are uh, prioritized for people. And one very important statistic is, you know, nationwide, uh, less than 10% of households have private motor vehicles or cars. And actually in Metro Manila, it's only about 12% uh, of households that have cars. So actually, when we are building more and more, you know, expressways, roads, and bridges, we're really benefiting only the most affluent, you know, 12% in Greater Manila. So uh, this is one reason why we have been campaigning for the insertion of a special provision in the budget in 2021, which will say that... Uh, for any new or rehabilitated road, DPWH should have uh, at least 50% of the road space devoted to public transport, walking, and cycling. So this ensures that there will be priority for the majority of Filipinos who do not use cars. And Kasi this will be a very important provision because when they implement now their guidelines on bike lanes, we should not hear the excuse that, oh, I'm sorry, we cannot do the bike lane kasi we need to preserve the car lanes that we have designed. There should be a willingness to sacrifice a car lane if the majority will have better mobility. So this is an important principle. Yeah, thank you, Aika. Thank you, Paul. So, Paolo? Yes, Aika. Uh, very, I think this is time to uh, introduce everyone uh, or those who haven't heard of it, the principle of induced demand. The uh, expansion of our, our road space uh, to cater to uh, these uh, individual vehicles or cars is, uh, is not a solution and because traffic is what we think of as a problem. But uh, uh, widening roads will not solve it. Induced demand is a principle now adopted by more progressive transport planners all over the world, but not yet in the Philippines. We're still expanding our roads, we're widening, we're building elevated skyways. Induced demand just says that the more roadway, road space you build, the more traffic it will induce. And this is seemingly counterintuitive, but it's true. In fact, in other progressive cities in other countries, they're tearing down the sky, the skyways because they have not proved the freeways going into cities have been torn down because they have not benefited uh, the people in the city or those coming in uh, by cars. The solution is rail and uh, BRT. The solution is alternative modes of transport. And uh, if anything at all, and it's very radical, you put a, a moratorium on road building for individual cars and focus, like uh, Rob is uh, saying, uh, into those uh, modes of transport that is mass-based ba mass uh, and that will move the most people uh, uh, the quickest and most efficiently. So that uh, principle of induced demand is something we have not learned. Uh, it's with pe my friends who are coming in, planners who are coming from overseas, come here and see all of the skyways and they, they just are astounded that we're still, you know, 20 years behind. We're, we're, we're uh, perpetuating the same mistakes that other countries have already learned from. And related to that, the biggest problem with transport 
and designing for any strategy in transport is the fact that it has to be related to land use planning. It's land use planning and how we um, put together our cities and our towns and our regions that needs to come first before the infrastructure is, uh, is brought in. And that's where we see another uh, imbalance in budgets. The new Department of Housing, Human Settlements and Urban Development and has a minuscule budget of 3.68 billion, which is, uh, which is a far cry from their requested 77 billion pesos. So 3.65, you can't do anything in terms of uh, proactive uh, uh, policies or any implementation at all for the departments that's supposed to handle human settlements and urban development, which is supposed to drive the needs for the transport infrastructure. We can't put the cart before the horse. That's a problem. Okay, uh, I agree, po, sir. So actually, the last time I checked, um, last year, meron pa tayong, at least I'm zooming in here uh, sa Metro Manila, there are six LGUs with outdated uh, land use plans. And um, yun nga, no? so um, land use and transport planning also should have to you know, go hand in hand. So, yun yung mga questions po if, natin if I, ngayon. If I may, yes, I, I, I'm glad you brought that. There are four that have uh, 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 old uh, land use plans, four out of the 17. Uh, okay. We have a problem specific to large metropolitan uh, areas where you have uh, five, six, up to 17, like in Metro Manila, LGUs uh, cheek by jowl, side by side. These LGUs in a metro uh, area like this cannot solve any of the problems, cannot uh, address land use planning, nor transport, unless it's as a whole metropolis. Uh, we have a flaw in our governance of uh, our metro areas in that we are still separate 17 in Metro Manila. So the fact is nothing gets done, not because of there's a lack of political will, we have 17 political wills in Metro Manila and 18 including the national, 18 plus including the national agencies. It's a matter of context. Individually, nothing get, gets solved. You, we're too fractured in terms of, uh, of uh, our approach to everything. I'll stop there. Thank you, Po. So, siguro, iko connect ko lang since related din naman to, to the MMDA, no? Although um, we didn't dip drill down to the MMDA budget. But when we talk about um, mobility, um, ang inisip kasi ng mga tao, traffic, di ba? Um, usually, yung inisip nila, as in traffic, as in movement of people. Um, and when we talk about traffic, um, the DOTR will always say that the mandate falls within MNTA. So, nagkakaroon po ng mga turuan. And isang, um, isang project then na um, I didn't see um, in the budget of the DOTR, at least um, wala yung loan proceeds, is the EDSA Greenways project. So, um, this was being talked about po, ano? <laughs> to, you know, um, more pedestrian infrastructure. Yeah. So, siguro baka mayroon pong pwedeng mag-comment about the Green Ways Project. Well, the DB DBM <laughs> had the Green, Green, Green uh, initiative. Yes, too. Uh, seems to have died. I, I believe it's still uh, operating this year, but uh, I have no word as to whether uh, they will they will pursue it in the next uh, fiscal year. And it's a well-intentioned uh, program. I was involved uh, uh, giving giving seminars to mayors uh, what Green 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 was, uh, and monies were disbursed, and a lot of the projects were actually built. It was a good start. It should continue. And if you look at the total quantums involved, uh, it's minuscule compared to the 600. Uh, uh, well, the trillions uh, for most of the infrastructure we're talking about. Again, it's a matter of. Uh, balance, we should uh, bring it back. And it should be already uh, part of a uh, regular infrastructure budgets, not not something that uh, disappears every administration. Okay. Ravi? So you're on Sorry, phone. thanks. Uh, I can, yeah, on that question, I maybe if I can add also, um, EDSA Greenways, what I've heard is that it is about to be uh, proposed for 
an, a loan from the Asian Development Bank. So probably by the end of the year, uh, it will be considered by the ADB board as a, as a possible loan to the Philippine government. Uh, where I think, uh, maybe I can just describe what it is. It's basically a project that will improve access to four MRT stations. So walkability and access to four MRT stations will be improved. So I would say uh, in normal times, this is desirable, but I would say as a pandemic response, it's not perhaps the highest priority because, you know, today, okay, if you improve the walkways to the MRT stations, then perhaps those who are standing in line might, you know, get maybe better uh, sort of a bet. They'd be in a better environment for the queue, but it's really more about expanding the capacity of MRT that will benefit a lot more commuters. And if we're talking about greenways, we really need to, to improve uh, pedestrian access, uh, you know, cycling safety on EDSA. Those are perhaps the priorities. You know, just look at how bad things are at, uh, at the ground level in terms for pedestrians on Ooh. EDSA. And this is what I would have expected in terms of something called EDSA Greenways. Thank you. I can, if I may add, no? Of course, sir. Yeah, apart from what uh, Robert, uh, Sir Robert has said, it appears na ang gastos pala niyang, ang gastos pala niyang green walkway na yan. No? Uh, mas, mas mahal pa siya per kilometer. Eh. Kung sa mga pag-aaral na tinitignan namin, mas mahal pa, pa siya kesa per kilometer in terms of cost, no? Per kilometer. Kung kukumpara mo halimbawa sa sa iba pang mga modes of transportation na pwede natin pag-invest na. But... Is it okay, Aika, if I shift a bit? Kasi interesado lang ako i-pursue talaga yung point ni, ni Sir Luis kanina. Eh, no? na, uh, I was, um, uh, this is not the first time I've heard it, but this is the first time I heard it you know, much in a, in, a, in a more powerful way. Na ang isang argument kasi ng BBB, Build, 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 ay yung, kapa, yung, yung matinding, yung, yung napakalaki niyang multiplier effect. No, uh, in fact, pag tinignan mo yung buong budget ng 2021, mukhang doon lang nila inaasa ng malaking bahagi ang jobs generation that, that we should be thinking of no, in order to address this massive unemployment that we're facing. No? Uh, but now, uh, Sir Lu Luis has pointed out that well, dubious yan pagdating natin sa, you know, sa karanasan natin dito sa Pilipinas. It might, it might have uh, some theoretical basis, but historically, mukhang, mukhang hindi nag-work sa Pilipinas yan. So, if that doesn't work in the Philippines, and now Sir Paolo is saying that other countries are actually tearing down their, their skyways because it actually leads to more traffic, shouldn't we be thinking, shouldn't we be rethinking about, rethinking the whole BBB, no? uh, and, and just reallocate a huge chunk of it to where we actually need it? No? So why should, we, why should we continue pushing for a huge uh, uh, amount uh, for BBB when it's not going to, you know, goods that we want sorry i you know, agree i'm just thinking out loud no now th thank you uh, sir Luis, for for putting that out yes Opo. Tama po kayo, sir. and one and i will segue na po to our next topic no and related to sinabi ni sir joshua kung if we were actually rethinking bbb Yung next question naman dun is um, the service contracting. No? Um, we didn't see this um, in the DOTR budget. And they are saying that because meron pa silang supposed allocation from um, the Bayanihan too. And at this point, um, senators are also questioning, kaya ba nilang i-disburse yung pera na meron sila? Dahil they have around, I think, 50 billion unspent. Um, as of um, a few months ago, last month. So, so yun po, um, any thoughts on um, service contracting? If this is something that the um, DOTR can actually, you know, disperse within the year and then maybe they can ask for more next year? Um, Sir Joshua, siguro po muna, um, Nugasuan Coalition and well, then Zorobi. Well, we need to, we need to have more uh, uh, service contracting budget for next year kasi nga, it is the only way that we can make sure 
na yung ating mga PUVs can um, can fly their route ng ng uh, sustainable way no kasi we're asking them to have physical distancing that has an impact do sa financial sustainability ng kanilang negosyo and the only way that we can enforce yung physical distancing uh, in 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 any effective way talaga the only effective way to enforce physical distancing is to make sure that yung mga drivers natin ay may guaranteed income na, therefore, hindi na kailangan talagang makipag-agawan ng pasahero. At more importantly, hindi nila concerned kung kikita pa sila that, that day or not because precisely they have to keep, mas mauuna kasi dapat yung health consideration natin eh, rather than yung financial viability nung nila. Pero hindi naman sila ang pwede magbayad noon, di ba? The, the state has to come in. So if the question is, do we need this? Yes. Now the question is, why is it that uh, why is it that uh, uh, the DOTR and LTFRB hasn't uh, implemented it, even if they already have 5.5 billion in the pipeline with, through Bayanihan 2? I think Sir Rob has a better way, of, is, a, is a, in a more be better position to answer that. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Joshua and uh, Aika. Well, my, my uh, I guess one point I want to make is that service contracting is a very new thing. And so, uh, Shempre at the start, it will, uh, it, it will have its hiccups. It will also perhaps have some uh, debugging necessary. Pero what I, I have to emphasize is it is probably the most important reform uh, in the transport sector uh, within the Duterte administration. We often think of projects like the build, build, build projects as making you know, an important difference. But one thing which we always overlook is that bad policies have held us back for so many decades. And one of the, uh, one of the issues that we all recognize is that yung policy framework natin for running public transport is a defective and obsolete one. You know, where we have many individual operators competing with each other and trying to fight for passengers, that model of operating public transport, we need to set aside for something that will be more stable, more organized, more efficient, more client friendly. Once we migrate into a service contract system, it enables government to manage uh, public transport in a more efficient way. You can also have, uh, you know, uh, schedules and uh, that are going to be predictable. You will have uh, commuters that will able that will be able to rely on uh, the the delivery of the service. So this is what we hope to get out of it. It should be a win-win both for the commuter as well as for the public transport industry, which today is really suffering from a huge instability and uncertainty. And this is perhaps the biggest threat that we have. Maybe as bad as the pandemic is the threat that we will lose a huge part of our public transport capacity. Yeah, thank you. Sir Paolo, do you want to add both? Yes, I'd, I'd like to broach a, a radical solution which we will need to think about, not just in this pandemic, but future pandemics and also in future disasters when it comes to public service, which is the concept of emergency services. Our civil defense uh, uh, clearly lacks the, the uh, material uh, uh, equipment that uh, can come into play when say the big one hits uh, Metro Manila and all the bridges are down and we were segregated into four large chunks of met the metropolis disconnected from each other because uh, we can't cross. Uh, we don't have the pontoon bridges in terms of transport uh, in any other country with uh, very good civil defense forces they have emergency transport that can come into play to, to bring people to where they want to get. Uh, it used to be done uh, 
decades ago, I remember during floods and they would bring the four by fours from the Philippine army. Unfortunately, our Philippine army have very much, much less equipment than they used to have. And they also had the amphibious trucks, which they use uh, also during the floods. Civil defense, uh, we need to look at, at funding our civil defense and ensuring that uh, civil defense forces have the equipment and material that will come into play, which could have been brought in for the pandemic to augment because of social distancing, say the public transport along EDSA. We could have brought those, uh, those uh, troop carriers well, uh, and other sorts of transport that are always in the ready, but which our Philippine Armed Forces need anyway. That's the whole uh, uh, part of the equation. We will need them. While, while they're not needed, they can be used by the army or uh, uh, transport can also be uh, commandeered, uh, just like in Japan, where a lot of uh, the services in, term, in times of disaster are already apportioned to private companies who are then uh, uh, assured that they will be reimbursed for all of the resources that they will contribute so that everyone survives. We have to look at that now uh, and we haven't done so. Thank you, sir. It actually reminded me of the first day when public transportation was supposed to be back. No, we saw. I mean, this June, we saw a lot of police trucks and um, police military trucks and pickup trucks. Tapos nakaupo lang dun sabay sabay yung mga tao. But I think this is really important, no, that we have an emergency transport system that actually yung pwede talagang upuan ng maayos, comfortable for commuters in case they are in distress po, ano. So, um, last before we go to the Q&A, um, meron po tayong mga very interesting questions dito. Siguro last na lang po. Um, my question is, um, we we have this um, road user tax, di ba? Itong uh, motor, motor vehicle users charge. And um, apparently, this is since this is launched na to the TVWH, there are around like 12 districts na pwede lang um, maka-tap into this fund. So I guess, how can we um, equitably distribute this um, fund? Um, given that um, around um, nationwide naman, um, LGUs really need to access such funds for their own um, transport um, needs or mobility needs. Um, maybe Sir Robbie, Sir Joshua, and then um, Sir Paolo. Yeah. Thank you, Aika. Maybe I can start by saying the history of the motor vehicle users uh, uh, fund uh, or tax. It used to be channeled mainly uh, for road maintenance, you know, that was the, the purpose. And then uh, a few other purposes were added, like uh, road safety and also, uh, you know, uh, improving the environmental outcomes, you know, and uh, having uh, low emission uh, transport. Uh, ngayon, I guess it's now become more centralized again within. Uh, DPWH and perhaps uh, less less transparent, and I think there's uh, perhaps uh, a need now to rethink uh, how we uh, use the motor vehicle users charge. By the way, uh, although it can also be adjusted by law in terms of the amounts and it, the amounts collected from you know through motor vehicle registration, it hasn't really been adjusted in a long time. Uh, actually, the executive, the president, has the power to uh, make an adjustment, inflation-based adjustment, even today, without legislation. So that could be done immediately as a revenue measure. But uh, possibly, uh, we should consider uh, increasing the motor vehicles users charge and looking at what would be the priority uses for that type of uh, revenue collection. And one thing that we have been talking about in uh, the Move Us One Coalition is to allocate a portion of that in order to subsidize the modernization 
of our public transport fleet. So that is one, one possible use, and that would help to address uh, one point that Sir Joshua mentioned earlier, which is masyadong mababa ngayon yung equity subsidy that's being provided. So kulang na kulang, it's not a sufficient incentive and it doesn't uh, provide sufficient viability to the uh, transport operator. So if we can increase the equity subsidy, but also uh, take that or fund that out of the motor vehicle users charge, then that would be uh, perhaps a good use. Another proposal is that we could also use it as a source of financing for the service contracting. So perhaps that could, that could be a way where uh, motor vehicle use could uh, help us finance sustainable mobility options. So this would be a very good way of channeling. Uh, in a way, it's like a syntax, you know. It's a way of, you know, uh, charging, you know, the sinners in order to, for us to move to a, you know, uh, a more desirable mobility environment. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Sir Josa? I think uh, Sir Robbie has already mentioned uh, what needs to be mentioned. No? I just want to highlight the fact that uh, kailangan talaga ng transparency and in, I think even even participation, no? direct participation ng mga commuters no? uh, and the riding public sa so pagdesisyon kung paano gagamitin talaga itong, itong tipo ng tax na ito. Kasi marami, pwede siyang magi useful talaga eh. Pero hindi po pwede na hindi ibukas sa publiko ang pag-uusap na yan Kasi otherwise, hindi maintindihan talaga ng mga nagdi-desisyon kung ano ang mas useful na paggamit sa kanya. Okay, thank you po, sir. Uh, sir Paolo, do you want to add pa po? Yeah, well, most most of what needed to be said was already said. and uh, But the additional uh, uh, use of, of road taxes as they do in London and in Singapore is, is as a disincentive to come into certain areas of uh, the city to be able to manage uh, "Quote unquote traffic," so it's it's the uh, this this uh, type of uh, strategy that's better than the than the uh, uh, coding method in trying to uh, manage uh, the volume of uh, individual cars in a city. We have to learn that lesson. Thank you, sir. Road pricing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, let's uh, go on to the Q and A. Um, I'll call Luis back. Um, Kung may questions uh, that he can also answer, no. So, uh, first uh, question: uh, Is adequate budget given being given to staff transport terminals? It always seems like terminals have little to no staff to ensure social distancing and to ensure that the queues do not spill over onto roads or other pathways. Maybe Silvis, although um, transport terminals are largely private. Yeah, um, I think this alludes to the point ni uh, Sir Robbie kanina that there's really a lack of uh, clear responsibility as to who uh, not only will build these terminals, especially when you know the EDSA busway, but but who will manage and maintain them. Uh, the most logical uh, uh, entity, as Sir Roy pointed out, is the LGU. And, and maybe if it's across the different jurisdictions, uh, MMDA, you know. Uh, and and uh, that, that's what happens when we just focus on the structure, but uh, forget about the entire ecosystem that needs to exist for that structure to uh, uh, fulfill its role. And so when we build these terminals, lalo na yung sa EDSA ngayon, yung sa gitna, the question is who, who is in charge of it? Uh, and, and I think uh, that's where these things uh, fail. It's because when it's built, nobody is there to clean it, maintain it. And um, I think uh, one uh, aspect of this localized uh, infrastructure that's necessary uh, which Sir Robbie pointed out earlier, is not just having LGUs uh, maintain them or maybe even build them, but at some point we also have to talk about LGUs having to fund them. 
uh, one right now it's become more apparent with the serious fiscal situation we're in where we're really grappling for funds for education for for health um, and so we need to maximize our reach in terms of financing all these development needs and one key power that LGUs have is the real property tax. Uh, one of the biggest beneficiaries of this infrastructure is the landowners to, who will benefit from the improved access. And that's something that is not often talked about. No? Um, a lot of the value that was created by all of these railways and, and MRT, all of the existing and the future ones, the landowners adjacent to these uh, developments will benefit a lot. And that value is not returned uh, yeah. to the government for that investment. So I think, I, I know LGUs are also having a big problem uh, these days, but it, it, it boggles me that the EDSA Greenway that Sir Rawi is talking about will be financed by a national loan when uh, these stations are probably in some of the richest uh, LGUs and the te the landowners beside these stations are probably some of the biggest conglomerates we have. And it bothers me why, how come we cannot find a strategy wherein the increased value of, in, in the lands of, of these adjacent properties are the ones and tasked to develop the, the, the surrounding areas since, in, in fact, the traffic benefits them and uh, more them than other taxpayers. Thank you, Luis. Um, there's another question. I think, if I may, Aika. I mean, uh, that's a good point. And in fact, uh, the LGUs, or in, the, in Metro Manila's case, it should be a metro authority to control it. Uh, Hong, Kong, Hong Kong's MTR system, and to a certain extent, uh, the SMRT in Singapore uh, actually looks at that. And the whole thing is to control the values of the lands uh, immediately around the terminals. And in fact, it's the developers. The, the, uh, the transit, transit Corporation is, uh, in fact, a real estate developer and apportions this so that uh, everyone benefits. And one of the other things that can be ensured if we have control is to, is to make sure that uh, uh, social housing or uh, lower income housing is built and not just condos to, to, for the rich and wealthy because it's the it's the uh, it's this this type of housing and the people that live in them are the ones that will uh, ride the MRT you don't want them having to compute so far just to get to the MRT and then commute some more and then uh, the nearest people are actually uh, the rich it, it's not uh, it's not equitable Thank you for anyone else? Just to point out, Aika, that that's actually one of the things that Nagka Isa, uh, to which I belong, has been, has been looking at. No? Kasi nga, nakikita namin, malaki ang pangangailangan talaga sa pag-finance ng recovery natin and pag-build better natin. No? Uh, and that's exactly what we wanted to push uh, uh, the government to do when we talked to the DOF uh, like two months ago. We mentioned that and then and uh, they said that uh, they wanted to have a discussion on it as well. So, baka maganda itulak natin yun. Thank you, Pa. So, Robbie, may gusto pa kayong i-add? Well, no, I, I was just saying, you know, there are several key points in the last, you know, a few uh, messages from our, our panel. Uh, I really uh, believe that, you know, in terms of policy reform, uh, giving local governments more responsibility and accountability for mobility results is really the way to go. So we need to push that. And part of that is really also uh, giving our metropolitan authorities, you know, more, more power. I, I would say that's what we need, especially we need a strong MMDA uh, sadly, uh, the MMDA's budget is smaller than maybe uh, half of the LGUs in Metro Manila. You know, so I would say if you have a very small budget, you really can't do much. You, you need also uh, perhaps a, a political structure. And maybe this is, you know, a more a long-term thing where you have an elected governor. governor which will then give that position more clout over you know, the 
the, the different LGUs that fall within the metropolitan area. So I, we've been talking about this for a long time, but I think it's really very much needed. And I hope, you know, uh, Congress will still consider it and uh, prepare for it. Thank you. Um, there's a there's a pending bill actually, but more on giving the MMEA more powers to do traffic related um, um, measures or policy making. So so meron pong next question. Um, this has been answered um, during uh, sa Zoom, but I guess um, for the benefit of those uh, watching us sa live, I will ask this question. This is from James Francis Miradora. How much is the budget for the improvement of sidewalks, especially in NCR, in the 2021 proposed national budget and in Biennium 2? Did it, did it increase? How much has been allocated for this in the past years? With limited public transport, this should also be prioritized. Uh, maybe, um, Luis, you can start. Yeah, um, I, I think uh, Sir Robbie can uh, improve on this furthermore okay. no? but the sidewalk is not budgeted because it's seen as an appendage of the road so kumbaga it's just a component of the road so we don't there, there's no specific uh, I, I guess that's a testament to how car centric the thinking is yeah. that uh, we see the road as the main infra and the sidewalk as a bonus parang ano lang siya parang uh, kailangan kas parang hump kailangan kasama para uh, maayos yung road uh, so i think that's one of the special provisions that uh, 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 move move as one coalition is pushing for so that's that's right luis uh, you know today we look at the sidewalk as like the residual so we prioritize the space for the cars and then whatever's left yun na lang yung sidewalk and we're hoping uh, that the special provision will turn it around. We need to prioritize first the space for uh, public transport, walking and cycling, and then yung residual na lang yung para sa koche, because that really reflects, in a way, the welfare of the majority. The majority are not car owners. We need to actually prioritize the use of our one of our most valuable infrastructure assets for the welfare of the majority. And that's part of this special provision that we're pushing. The other part is also to make sure that it is uh, accessible for all, all, uh, all abilities and it should be compliant. Because we have a lot of sidewalks also, but they're not compliant with our accessibility laws. So maybe Paolo can talk about that. And we, we need to make them shaded. And this is also an advocacy yes. of Paolo, how to make them shaded because shaded sidewalks will actually make our urban environment much more liv livable. So maybe over to you, Paolo. Yeah, Robert, uh, Robbie, that, that's right. Uh, uh, 20 years ago, we developed a, a metric for uh, assessment of sidewalks when we were first involved in the improvement of pedestrianization in the Makati CBD. It is a uh, one to five uh, rating, wh which depends on whether you have weather cover, whether you have shade, whether the pavement is broken, whether there are any driveways. Our assessment at the time in late 90s for Makati, which already has the best sidewalks in Metro Manila, well, our rating was between 2.5 to 3.5, uh, 5 being the most ideal where there are no, no uh, breaks in the sidewalk, where you have full cover, where when it rains, you're covered. Manila would have rated 1 or 0 <laughs> for most of the sidewalks. And this we use also in, uh, in Ortiga CBD when we did the assessment. Yes. So our, our sidewalks fail in, in other countries, in other nation, in other uh, uh, cities there, they even have departments of sidewalks or departments for urban design, which looks at that missing component uh, of the road right away uh, that is for people and that is for intermodal transfer from where you ride to get to your next ride, uh, where the space for terminals, which we, which we discussed earlier, the problem with social distancing is that there's not enough space to space uh, to 
provide, we have to embed that already in the new normal. And this is where, like in Singapore, all of their terminals uh, are, 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 are uh, placed near open spaces because you have uh, uh, the park and ride, you have the bicycle parking and the car parking, and then you ride the MRTs. It's all part of a system. So there's intermodal uh, transfers already built into the infrastructure. And we here, we just designed for the train and nothing else, or we just designed for the, for the car and nothing else. There's so much that's lacking in terms of physical design. I, I just wanted to add, parang as a point of uh, equity, diba? if you think about roads as uh, having to be financed only by those who use it, so if you think na yung mga roads natin, kailangan ang bubayad lang yung gagamit, ang binabayaran ng car owners, as you pointed out, with the motor vehicles uh, use charge, it's just 12 billion pesos next year. So if if all the car owners, if their additional contribution to government is just 12 billion, and the and the cost of improving maintaining the road is more than that. Essentially, the commuters in the sidewalk are subsidizing the yes. car owners in that road. Yes. So, nakakagulat yun na parang uh, yung attention that we're giving them is not equal to the resources that they are putting in. So, kung tanungan ng ambagan, mas may ambag at mas may right. You can argue extreme extreme case naman, no? yung commuter rather than the car owner. Yeah, but let let me uh, point out one thing also. A lot of people say, oh, magandang pag-usapan to, magandang ano, pero hindi natin kaya dito. But it's wrong. Uh, that is wrong. We have already proven that uh, sit secondary cities like uh, Iloilo uh, and to uh, certain portions of Pasig have been able to do it. In Iloilo, we convinced the DPWH to give us 40% of Aquino Avenue for bikes and pedestrians. And because there was a unified political will, we did it and it now works. Iloilo is the most bike friendly. They are totally mobile now. There are established uh, loops. In fact, the bike, uh, bike NGOs, the bikers have gotten together and they have now improved on what we initially already provided with segregated. They have uh, taken over one lane of Aquino Avenue. They have uh, implemented with the city's participation uh, uh, barriers with, with planting. So it's totally green, it's wonderful. And it's, it's proof of concept that it can be done if you had the uh, communal will of everyone. I think if I may add, uh, I, this is, sorry, this is really important, no? I, na, na, na excited ako kanina, gusto kong tanong yun eh. Ano ba rating ko sa city, Sir Paolo? <laughs> ano ba rating city at that time? But I wanted to add as well that we should not only talk about uh, improving pavements, no? I think we should also talk about streets that are banned for, for cars. I mean, yes. I mean, we need we need to identify, and it can be done, no? Yes, we it can be done. Identify streets that are solely for people, simply because ninety percent of us don't own cars. So, <laughs> yes, yes. And, yeah. and 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 sa karanasan nat sa karanasan na nakikita natin sa ibang bansa, lalo na no, at kahit sa ilu ilu nga eh. Pag ginawa mo yam, it it encourages people to be, you know, it, you, you actually create more creative spaces for people. Well, exactly, but we have also to introduce the concept of shared streets, so what, what the uh, Europeans, uh, Northern Europeans called Wunner. So the Wunner concept is sharing the street. You prioritize people, but you still allow the cars because some of the house owners or business owners will need uh, some vehicles to access, and it can be done. Right before COVID, we were studying uh, the ap applicability of some of this to, to streets in Poblacion Makati. And we were at that point that we were going to make the presentations, but then the pandemic happened. But uh, similar similar uh, interventions were planned for Intramuros. Uh, and again, because of uh, all of this, but it can be done and it has proven to be workable in a lot of cities worldwide. Thank you, sir. Actually, nakita talaga natin yung shared streets. No? Um, I think in relation to Sir Joshua's point, um, banning cars, um, we're seeing that um, in Pasig, di ba, um, sa, may, sa may Emerald um, every Sunday. Um, we also saw this in, at least more radical, in Times Square in New York, right? Um, they closed yes. off a, a huge portion of that because um, the mayor is pushing for road safety, more pedestrian infrastructures, um, rethinking um, 
the use of roads. So on a related note, um, meron po kong um, follow-up question here um, regarding dun sa rating that um, Sir Paolo mentioned. Um, was this sidewalk rating similar to the LOS rating that they use in North America for assessing road intersections? Uh, level of service, no, slightly different. Uh, this is a self, uh, we developed it ourselves with the uh, uh, two professors from the University of the Philippines College of uh, Landscape Architecture, Professor uh, Espino and, uh, and pro uh, pro prof Professor Galingan. And it was a one to five. Uh, and we applied it to all of the streets in Legaspi and Salcedo villages. We had teams of, of four uh, people documenting and assessing based on a uh, metric we developed. And it's specific to uh, our, our needs. Uh, and that gave the justification for the uh, over 1 billion pesos that the uh, Makati uh, Association of Building Owners has spent in the last 20 years to improve the sidewalks of uh, Makati CBD in terms of uh, the pavement, the putting of covered walkways. Uh, and we found on certain in intersections na hindi kailangan na masyadong malapad yung uh, road. So we put what is called bump outs so that we brought the curb to curb distance between corners uh, uh, closer by one third. So pedestrians have this as uh, speed tables. So we're prioritizing, prioritizing pedestrians in Legaspi and Sabtero village. We tried it out in three intersections. Everybody loves it. We're doing another six more. Eventually, we are re retrofitting everything in Legaspi and Salcedo to be pedestrian priority rather than car priority. And that will enable you effectively, you can walk from one end of the CBD to the other without having to uh, get into the car or having to stop for a car. Uh, Aika, can I add one thing? You know, since we're talking about, you know, this uh, making urban environments, you know, more pedestrian friendly and also uh, trying to reduce sort of the dominance of cars. One of the interesting things that that might be tried even just on an experimental basis, you know, in the DPWH budget, uh, they have like these 13 bridges in Metro Manila that they're uh, building. Some of them are uh, new bridges, some are rehabilitation yeah. of old bridges. But what if, what if once they're finished, we open them up, but only to pedestrians, bicycles, and public transport, so no cars. And actually, my, my uh, feeling is that it would change the character of mobility in the entire Metro Manila if we did that. And why not try it, you know? We can do it one bridge at a time and see what happens. Why not, you know? And that hopefully the DPWH will consider it. Yeah, in fact, Robbie, if I may, the cost of one of those vehicular bridges will fund five pedestrian bridges across the Pasig. And there are certain points across the Pasig where if you had a pedestrian bridge, it would cut an hour trans transit time for one who's on the other side, say Mandaluyong, to get to, to Makati or from Pasig. Well, of course, now you have the Pasig Bridge. But uh, we, in other cities, we have they have dedicated pedestrian bridges. Here we don't. It's all vehicles. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Po. Um, let's move on to another question. This has also been answered in the Zoom's Q&A panel, but um, I'll ask it here for everyone's input now. Uh, it's often said now na while businesses recognize the importance to develop public transport around their lands and properties, some businesses do the opposite. They try to influence public transport away from their properties if they think it will degrade the value. Example, high-class areas that don't want upper-class uh, elite uh, mingling with middle-class and communities. Um, any comments? You know, Aika, I think that's that view is changing because even you know I think in the most I think uh, you know uh, upmarket malls I think they they recognize that a lot more people are uh, getting to their properties using bicycles using uh, by walking uh, using public transport uh, it, it and you know today. Uh, 
when you actually survey a lot of uh, young people of all income classes, I think many of them would uh, rather use uh, public transport or cycling or walking instead of taking a car. You know, there's a there's a a big shift away from you know car use because I think a lot of people are thinking you know it's a hassle to bring a car around these days. It's a hassle to uh, to park. It's a hassle to drive in traffic. If I can move around fast, right, with a scooter, with a bicycle, with walking or public transport, I'd rather do that. And I think there's a great opportunity, uh, even from the private sector, to, to contribute to that transformation. And just one example is the treatment we have of parking. So I want to talk a little bit about parking policy because, you know, we have one, in a way, uh, I guess, uh, counterproductive policy, which is what we call parking minimums. We require every developer to allocate so many parking spaces depending on their floor area. And what, what does that do? Every parking space is a parking space for a car and it attracts, of course, more car use. But what if, you know, some of these spaces could actually be well, some of them could be for bicycles, but maybe it could be instead a public transport terminal or it could be converted into commercial space. You could have perhaps in a, in a place that's accessible, it could have zero parking spaces, right? So I think this is something that we should consider. It's, it's uh, adopted now in many cities abroad that are pushing sustainable mobility, removing parking from the center of the city and actually uh, making, you know, uh, in a way, inducing more public transport or sustainable mobility instead of car use. Yes, and if I may, to counter the, uh, the opposition from some of the business owners that if you remove the parking in front, uh, they will lose business when uh, Pearl Drive uh, closed uh, closed uh, uh, itself to traffic uh, in an experiment last year. In fact, the the all of the restaurants there saw an uptick because a lot of people walked to the restaurants and they did not lose uh, any money at all from from the from the road closure. So uh, one of the biggest uh, enemies of the the Filipino sidewalk is the off seat off street parking or the curb cuts in any other city na naman hindi ka pwede mag curb cut curb cut is meaning you use the front easement of your property as parking so ginagamit ng kotse pang back up and then you 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 disturb the flow of the traffic and you also prevent uh, pedestrians from crossing so it has been abused to totally in in all of our towns and cities and people feel they have the right to park vehicles using that sidewalk as essentially your driveway it shouldn't be done and paulo they've destroyed a lot of sidewalks that way right if yes. you have a car going that's why you see so many cracks on sidewalks exactly exactly okay. uh thank you so much paul um before we end um there are a few questions that uh, were left unanswered but were answered sa zoom uh, maybe if you um, our organizers will send some of the questions uh, for you to respond, if you can, and then send it back to our participants. So before we end, I'll ask uh, everyone for uh, a few thoughts. Uh, let's start po muna with Luis, um, and then, I uh, know, let's start with um, Sir Robbie, Sir Joshua, Sir Paula, and then Luis. Well, um, my, my final thought is, you know, today we have the pandemic, but it's also a great opportunity for change. The pandemic has highlighted so many of the weaknesses in our mobility environment, but it's given us also the, the realization that things can change quite fast and we can take advantage of that. You know, all of us who are advocates or who believe in more 
sustainable uh, transport you know uh, options so uh, we should continue to pursue this and we hope our officials and legislators will see it also as a, an opportunity to achieve results you know even in the last two years of the Duterte administration there can be significant benefits if they take the right policies if they spend the right way so that's really my my point thank you thank you sir sir joshua well, i love sir robbie's optimism parate because uh, build up on his optimism and yes definitely this is this is uh, this has uh, forced us to rethink and and try to work build back better you know however let me just put a caveat no na hindi po pwede talaga it is completely unacceptable for us now these changes i kakarga natin sa, sa pamagitan ng pag-sacrifice ng mga transport workers natin. This is the reason why, exactly the reason why we filed the Supreme Court case against the DOTR and the LTFRB no, uh, for their discriminatory policies no, against the uh, uh, open-air jeepneys. No? So that kind of thinking must stop. No? Our policymakers, I would like to see our policymakers for this optimistic view of uh, Sir Robert to be realized, we'd like to see our policymakers to stop to start thinking strategically. No, dinawin natin talaga ano ba ang gusto nating mangyari para nang sa ganun hindi ko patchi-patchi ang ating mga patakaran. Thank you sir, Sir Paolo. Yes, uh, I agree that uh, with with uh, the other panelists and and uh, Robbie said it the pandemic has given us pause to uh, to think, but uh, all of our towns and cities uh, have have needed uh, to be fixed anyway. Even even before the pandemic, we and we have not focused our attention and our budgets to to fix all of these systemic problems of how we plan land use in our cities, how we provide infrastructure, and how we govern them. But having said that, and problem is very complex it is not insurmountable and i always point to to certain progressive cities uh, pasig iloilo uh, the, some of the visayan uh, uh, cities that it can be done but the first thing to do is always to take the first step of course if you don't have a sidewalk you cannot take that first step but we have to do that first step thank you thank you sir luis yes you just to end um the value of infrastructure, the multiplier of infrastructure, rests on the assumption that it helps move people, move goods, move information. We've seen that uh, the build, build, build projects of the past three years have not done that because they haven't increased the investments. Eh? So maybe rather than uh, we should rethink the one trillion in build, 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 and maybe look for realignment opportunities towards projects that will move, move, move. Because that's what creates economic activity. Uh, thank you. So thank you everyone for joining us. That was a really insightful uh, webinar. We talked about uh, what needs to be prioritized. Uh, maybe we have to rethink the policies or the projects that are included, that are funded um, in the proposed 2021 budget and then maybe we can insert some of the projects like BRT or um, uh, funding for service contracting um, and a few others no um, some of the suggestions also included like um, having dedicated uh, more dedicated lanes for uh, public transportation um, um, Re, uh, rethinking the use of sidewalks instead of using it as parking spaces and um we we heard from our panelists that um a, a really balanced uh, look no um on the proposed budget for for mobility for transportation uh, for infrastructure is needs to be taken so i guess um I, i'll leave you uh with this um question no um will the congress since uh, ambol ay nasa kongreso no will the congress actually listen to these uh, suggestions um what will we see when um the budget reaches um the bicam what would be the amendments um bibigyan ba nila ng um pakikinggan ba nila ang pangangailangan ng ating mga transport um workers at um isang question ay 
kung talagang bibigyan ba nila ng allocation no para masabi talaga nating commuters naman. So this is the fourth episode of the Budget Watch webinar hosted by Rappler and I lead in partnership with Move as One Coalition. I am Ikari. Thank you for joining us.